Good day everyone, we are going to start our inflammation series today and we will start with acute inflammation. So this is the outline for today, so we are going to concentrate more about the acute inflammation going through the basics, mediators and what are the cardinal signs and then to the morphological patterns. So before we start, we have to explain first what is inflammation. So just to give you a simple explanation about inflammation, imagine that we have here a blood vessel. So this is a blood vessel. Inside the blood vessel, we have the inflammatory uh, cells like neutrophils and lymphocytes. And once we have, for example, a trigger like infection, uh, usually we have the neutrophils going out or the lymphocyte going out. So when we have the neutrophils coming out, this is the acute inflammation process. When you have lymphocyte coming out into, into the interstitium, this is called the chronic inflammation. So this is just a simplified concept of inflammation. So going back to the definition of uh, inflammation, it is a complex reaction against specific stimuli consisting mainly of the um, blood vessel and leukocyte and uh, blood vessels and leukocytes. So it can be classified into the acute inflammation and the chronic inflammation as we explained in this uh, simple uh, picture in here. So now, what is the hallmark feature of acute inflammation? The hallmark feature is edema or fluid. So it's basically increased vascular permeability causing the swelling that you will see in the uh, inflammation. And also you will have neutrophils um, filling the interstitial space or the uh, tissue. What can be the causes? Most commonly, it's the infectious cause as you have, in, uh, for example, uh, the gram-negative bacteria that can cause it and also gram-positive bacteria. And we will talk about some clinical correlations um, w when we get into other slides in the mediators. Uh, another cause is the tissue necrosis, and this is really high yield information because uh, tissue necrosis will lead into acute um, uh, inflammation, and a clinical correlation of that when you have a myocardial infarction or MI, usually they have leukocytosis, particularly uh, uh, neutrophils are going to be high in the CBC for um, after a few hours or a few days after the uh, MI. Another thing you should know about the acute inflammation that it is um, really immediate. It will have an immediate response. However, it's not specific. So that's what we mean by the immunity, the innate immunity. So basically innate immunity, it is a limited uh, specificity to a specific antigen. So there is no memory and it's a generalized response against an antigen. So there is no memory, there is no specificity against an antigen. However, it's really fast and immediate response. Now going to uh, the important slide of acute inflammation. So we have here the mediators of the acute inflammation and we will talk about each one separately. Starting first with the toll-like receptor as part of the mediator. So it can be found in innate and adaptive immunity, which means you can find it in both acute and chronic inflammation. In acute inflammation, it is found on the macrof macrophages and also on the dendritic cells, which is basically the cells of the uh, innate immunity. Okay, so uh, it recognizes some patterns or some molecules that found in, uh, on the microbes called the pathogen-associated molecular pattern, which is uh, called the PAMS. So the pa it recognizes the PAMS. And uh, for an example of that, when you have a gram-negative bacteria, they usually have what we call the LPS, which is the lipopolysaccharide. The lipopolysaccharide, there is a specific cell that's going to recognize it, which is the macrophages using the um, PAMS pattern. So the macrophages will recognize this lipopolysaccharide through CD14, and this is really important to know, a really important correlation to this uh, specific point. Another thing uh, that uh, the TL, uh, TLRs can do is the NF-kappa B reg upregulation. So it's basically acting like a molecular switch. So a molecular switch, so when we have the toll-like receptors activated, this will be um, switched on, and then you will have the acute inflammation also switched on. Now going to the second mediator, which is archidonic acid metabolites, which are found into, uh, in the phospholipid cell membrane uh, through the enzyme called the uh, phospholipase A2. 
So it can go into uh, two pathways, which is the cyclooxygenase pathway and the lipooxygenase pathway. In the cyclooxygenase pathway, you will notice that we have the prostaglandins, uh, which is prostaglandin I2, D2, and E2. Their main action is arteriolar vasodilation and also you have incre increased vascular permeability and um, this uh, permeability will happen specifically in the post capillary venule. A really important uh, point in here that we have the prostaglandin E2 that is responsible of fever that has two E's also and pain. So prostaglandin E2 responsible of the fever and pain. And the lipooxygenase, which will produce the leukotrienes. So the leukotrienes, we have different uh, kinds. However, we have the B4 that is responsible for the activation and the attraction of the neutrophils to the site of the inflammation. We have also leukotriene C4, D4, and E4, which are um, responsible for the vasoconstriction, bronchospasm, and increased vascular permeability. And they can do that through uh, increasing the uh, smooth muscle contractility. So smooth muscle will contract and then it will lead to the increased vascular permeability. Do you know what are the smooth muscles that can be found in the blood vessels? It's called the pericytes. So pericytes will contract. The third mediator is the mast cells. So the third mediator can be activated through three different ways. So mast cells can be activated through tissue trauma, C3A and C5A, which is in the complement system, and we will go uh, uh, to explain more about this in the upcoming slide. And then cross-linking of the surface IgE by an antigen. So you have here a cell that has a surface IgE receptor, Okay, so you have the receptors and then you will have a cross reaction between those two receptors. This uh, can happen, for example, in asthma as a clinical uh, co correlation, okay? Uh, now, we will go to the response of the mast cells. The response of the mast cells can be classified into immediate response and delayed response. The immediate response usually will have to uh, release of the preformed uh, histamine granules that will lead into vasodilation and increased vascular permeability. The vasodilation, as we know, in the arteriolar, uh, arteriolar uh, level and uh, the permeability on the post capillary venules. The delayed effect is going to be through leukotrienes. So leukotrienes will maintain so uh, will maintain the effect of the acute inflammation. So and this is a uh, really important information in here. They usually come in exams. What is the delayed effect of the uh, mast cells? It's going to be through the leukotrienes to maintain the acute inflammation. Now going to the fourth mediator, which is the complement system. Complement system is basically the pro-inflammatory proteins that are found in the serum inactivated. It can be activated through different pathways, the classical pathway, alternative pathway, or the mannose binding lectin pathway, uh, or the MBL. The classical pathway is usually when you have C1 binding to IgG, okay, or IgM. And then that will bind into the antigen and then will activate the complement system. The alternative pathway, when you usually have the microbial product, will uh, activate the system. The MBL is uh, when you have the uh, MBL binding to the mannose that is found in the microbe and then it will activate the complement system. Then we will have specific products. Those products are going to be C3 convertase, C5 convertase, and the MAC, which is the membrane attack complex. C3 convertase, as we know from the immunology uh, basics, it will give us the uh, C3B and C3A, okay? The same in here, so it will give us A and B of the C5, and then we have the membrane attack complex, which is basically composed of C6 up to C9 together. Now coming into the C3A and C5A. So those are called the anaphylatoxin. So anaphylatoxin, which will activate the mast cells and cause the degranulation of the mast cells. As we know, in the previous slide, we mentioned that uh, C3A and C5A are part of the activation of the mast cell. So this will lead into the degranulation of the mast cells and uh, release of the preformed histamine, okay? The C5A is also considered as chemotactic for the neutrophil cells, so it will attract the neutrophils to come there. 
Uh, and then we have the uh, membrane attack complex that will lead to lysis of the microbes uh, through forming a hole into the microbe and then causing uh, disturbance of the cell hemostasis. Now coming to our last mediator, which is Higman factor or factor 12, which is found in the coagulation uh, series or coagulation pathway. So it is basically an inactive pro-inflammatory protein. Uh, it is produced from the liver and it's activated by exposure to the subendothelial or tissue collagen. And this happens, uh, and this usually happens when there is a, an injury to the tissue. Now, what is the response of activation of Higman factor? A very important thing that it causes, the, and it's really related to the um, DIC or uh, disseminated intravascular uh, coagulation. And usually it's uh, seen with gram negative sepsis. So this is really high yield and usually seen in examination. So it's, uh, it will have coagulation and fibrinolytic pathway that might lead to DIC. Uh, it will also uh, activate the complement system and the kinin system. In the kinin system, what does it do? It will produce the bradykinin and bradykinin is responsible of pain. And what is also responsible of pain that we mentioned before? Prostaglandin E2. Other functions of the bradykinin is going to be vasodilation and vascular permeability that will increase. This is just a picture to show you what is, uh, what is happening during the acute inflammation process. So you have three steps in here. Increase the blood flow that will be responsible of the erythema or redness that can be seen. Leakage of the plasma protein that will lead into edema and swelling uh, because of the fluid in the interstitium. And finally, we have the neutrophil immigration. And this um, uh, will lead to destruction of the microbe or uh, relieving the trigger uh, that is uh, triggering the acute inflammation and we will talk about this in more details in another video to explain how the neutrophils are going to immigrate to the site of the inflammation and what is the role of macrophages in the acute inflammation for those who need uh, more explanation. From all what we have explained in the previous slides this is going to explain the cardinal signs of inflammation so let's see. The first one is going to be redness and warmth, which is rubber and calor. This is usually caused by vasodilation and increased blood flow, and we have the specific mediators to cause it, like prostaglandin, histamine, and bradykinin. You also have the swelling because of the edema, usually because of the tissue damage that will lead into mast cell um, activation and histamine uh, granules um, release. And also we have pain that is responsible uh, uh, because of the pain mediators. We have bradykinin and prostaglandin E2. Fever, as we know, because of the prostaglandin E2 and pyrogens will produce uh, pyrogens, which means uh, some microbes will produce IL-1 and TNF uh, from the macrophages, and this will lead to um, COX activity in the hypothalamus and then activation or production of the prostaglandin E2. Finally, we have the loss of function, and this is because of the limited action because all of the previous uh, signs. This is a picture just to show you the, what is happening in the acute inflammation and what happens if it progresses more and more. So either it's going to be into the resolution and we will talk about it in another video and what's going to happen in the neutrophil migration and how are we going to reach into, into the resolution process. Uh, or it can lead into pus formation as part of the outcome or the abscess formation. It can lead also to the healing, okay? with fibrosis and scar eventually or it can progress into the uh, to the chronic inflammation and it will lead to um, lymphocytes will be there and angiogenesis and finally will lead to fibrosis and collagen deposition and finally will lead to loss of function. Now, to be clinically more oriented from the pathology part and basic pathology part into the clinical and uh, correlation part, we will talk a little bit about the morphologic and pattern that can be seen in real life. So we can see uh, the serous inflammation, we can see the fibrinous uh, inflammation, separative and ulcers, and we will talk about each one of them in details. Starting first with the serous inflammation. 
So this is a picture of the uh, serous inflammation that you can see there is separation of the, um, uh, of the two layers in here because of the fluids and plasma uh, will be um, uh, accumulated in there. Where can you see that? You can see that in effusion, in the cases of pleural effusion, and sometimes with ascites and other effusions in the body cavities. You can see it also with skin blisters, and this is what you can see in here. So you can see here the epidermis is um, separated from the dermal layer. Second form is going to be the fibrinous inflammation. So the fibrinous inflammation, you will have increase in the vascular permeability. It will lead to leakage of the fibrinogen into the extracellular or interstitial uh, space forming the fibrin. This fibrin, okay, will uh, be a characteristic of inflammation of the uh, body cavities like the pleura and meninges and pericardium. When this happens in the pericardium, it would lead to obliteration of the pericardial space and it will lead to constrictive, it will lead to constrictive pericarditis. Uh, if, if it's not removed, so this will lead to scar tissue formation. As we said, it can, you can implicate it into the pericardium, so it will lead to constructive pericarditis. This is just a picture to show you and elaborate more about the fibrinous inflammation that can happen in the pericardium, leading to constructive pericarditis, and here you can see the appearance of the acute inflammation. Now going to the third morphological pattern, which is the separative inflammation or the purulent inflammation. From the name, we can infer that it contains pus. What is pus? So pus is basically containing uh, dead neutrophils, necrosis or liquefactive necrosis and edema. So three characteristics of the pus or the purulent exudate. Examples that can uh, cause the separative inflammation, we have the staph aureus and acute uh, appendicitis. Uh, it can lead to an abscess formation. What do we mean by abscess formation? It's basically localized connection or a collection of purulent inflammatory cells. So it's localized. Uh, they usually have a central region of uh, necrotic tissue and white blood cells and a peripheral region that contain the macrophages to make the fibrous wall of the abscess. As you can see here in the lung, this is a lung, you can see here multiple separative inflammation in here containing pus. And you can also see here the predominance of neutrophils. Finally, going to the last morphological pattern that can be seen in acute inflammation, which are ulcer, which is ulcers. Uh, so uh, what is ulcer? So an ulcer is a local defect of the surface of a certain organ or a tissue. It can be produced by sloughing of the inflamed uh, necrotic tissue. So, so we have here necrotic tissue that happened and we will going to remove it or sloughing it or shedding it. Okay. Most commonly seen in the mucosa of the stomach and, uh, and intestine as we have also the peptic ulcer disease can, cor can correlate to that as part of the acute inflammation. It can be seen also in the genitourinary tract. Some STDs can cause some ulcers. Skin and subcutaneous tissue of the lower extremities in older persons who have diabetes mellitus or sometimes when, we, when they have um, circulatory disturbances like atherosclerosis. This is the area of the ulcers, just to illustrate more. So you have here the normal mucosa and then you have here the shedding of the necrotic tissue. Coming to the end of this part of the series of inflammation, these are our references and thank you everyone for watching.